On today's episode, NASA has a problem on Mars, a mission to Saturn's moon Titan, and how to make concrete on the moon. NASA has a big problem. Their plan to bring back the Martian soil samples collected by the Perseverance rover since 2021 is too expensive, and it will take too long to complete. So, with the recent budget cuts forcing their hand, NASA has officially started asking around for better ideas. The official request for proposals went out on April 16th to NASA research centers and laboratories like JPL, who handle most of the administration's robotic missions to other planets, but they have also put out the call to commercial launch providers and mission specialists to cast as wide a net as possible. Obviously, as budget cuts are a major push behind this decision, NASA will want to keep the costs down, but they have said that the winning proposals will receive funding for research into the feasibility of the new plans. Aside from that, the current request is fairly vague. No mention of price caps or mission architecture that NASA wants included, and also no mention of timeline at all, aside from an understanding that the administration would like all initial proposals to be submitted by fall 2024. But while we don't have much information about mission constraints, we can assume a few things about what they're looking for. The most recent independent review of NASA's Mars sample return mission as it had been planned, showed that it would cost about $11 billion and wouldn't be able to retrieve the samples and bring them back to Earth before the 2040s. So we can assume that NASA is at least looking for a plan that is cheaper and faster than that. The original Mars sample return mission involved sending a lander to meet up with the Perseverance rover in the Jezero crater. This lander would carry smaller fetch rovers that would catch up with the older Perseverance and gather samples to return to the lander and the small rocket on board. Once gathered, this rocket would lift off from the surface, break orbit from the red planet, and fall back to Earth. That plan has changed a couple of times, but the big point is that it never really became fully fleshed out, and the plans NASA did have were clearly too expensive to produce with any speed. Typically, NASA has attempted to keep missions like these either in-house or just between international partners like the European Space Agency, who were a partner on the original MSR mission. But opening up this program to commercial interests is a huge opportunity for companies like SpaceX. And that's just the easiest guess at a top contender. It's no secret that Elon Musk and his company have been building towards a Mars mission of their own since starting their rocket program. So if they could get some extra government funding to support their development, why wouldn't they? It's a pretty safe bet that they would not only put forward a proposal, but that a SpaceX proposal would have some of the best chances of being successful. But they are not the only ones. Other large companies like Blue Origin could likely have the ability to make it to Mars, but also some up-and-coming ones like Rocket Lab, who have successfully proven their capability to safely take payloads out to the moon without much difficulty. Of course, we shouldn't discount the more traditional teams like the engineers at JPL or any of the NASA groups and international partners who have both the talent to be able to solve this problem and could very much use the funding that would come from winning this proposal. It is difficult to see NASA having to struggle so hard just to finish their biggest Mars mission ever, while the military can afford to fund a slew of projects closer to home. But under the circumstances, opening up the floor to commercial companies who have been able to come up with some innovative ways of completing difficult missions on the cheap just seems like the most practical way to go. Tuesday was a big day for NASA announcements as the US Space Administration also announced that the Dragonfly mission to Saturn's moon Titan would not be delayed again and would be launching in July of 2028. Dragonfly is a nuclear-powered, car-sized flying drone made by the engineers at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. The plan is for Dragonfly to make focused hops using its quadrotor design every single Titan day, or 16 Earth days, from area to area hunting for signs of life. If it manages to keep to the 2028 launch date, Dragonfly will reach Titan by 2034 and is designed to operate for two and a half years of focused investigation of the distant moon. Titan is the largest moon of Saturn and is the only moon in our entire solar system that has a thick atmosphere. Titan only receives about 1% of the sunlight we do, so the average surface temperature 
is around negative 183 degrees Celsius, which liquefies the planet's methane. This might be a strange environment to go looking for life, but it's the liquid hydrocarbon lakes and oceans dotting Titan's surface that make NASA curious about the sort of prebiotic life we could find, like a time capsule of ancient Earth before bacteria even started forming. Dragonfly was able to pass a series of independent reviews last year, but even so, NASA was forced to delay the project until they could see just how bad their budget would be affected in 2024. Unfortunately, they were correct, and the recent budget has forced the administration to rethink several large projects, but not Dragonfly. Sure, the drone definitely cost more than the original estimations. Initially, the project was capped at $1 billion, but after the independent reviews, it's clear that Dragonfly will cost something more, like $3.35 billion. Not grossly expensive compared to other NASA projects, but still more than the $2.73 billion allocated for robotic planetary exploration in their new budget. Most projects have a tendency to grow in costs as designs evolve, and things like the recent pandemic take their toll, but NASA deciding to not delay Dragonfly again is a good sign that they believe they can manage this mission and finally send a flying robot to one of the biggest rocky worlds in the outer solar system. The mad dash to getting a lunar colony up and running has included a lot of research into new technologies, and a recent paper from a team in China identifies four main techniques for using the dusty soil of the moon to make concrete, and save a lot of effort in the process. The big problem with making a permanent habitat on the moon's surface is that transporting and landing all the gear, supplies, and materials needed to even construct a colony would require a tremendous effort. Space and weight requirements alone would demand that if we brought everything with us, we'd need to make way more trips, which is why many scientists and engineers are trying to think of a way to use in-situ materials, that is, the lunar regolith in this case, to do most of the big structural work so we don't have to lug a bunch of construction material all the way to the moon. This sort of technique is used here on Earth more and more, but especially in hard to reach places, local Earth and other materials on location are used to make as much as possible, but especially concrete. And that's what this paper from Tsinghua University in China is all about. Concrete is a versatile building material that can be made with very little supplies, so it's ideal for our purposes on the moon, and the researchers behind this paper, led by Professor Feng, have identified four main methods of creating the solid material. The first is reaction solidification, which is using small amounts of reactive compounds to quickly bond local regolith into concrete formations. It requires bringing material with us, but certainly less than we otherwise would. Next, we have sintering and melting, which is exposing the regolith to high temperatures to bond them together. Concrete is formed using water and other materials on Earth in order to create a sort of crystalline formation that gives the finished product its strength. Obviously, moisture can't happen on the moon. No atmosphere means any fluid would boil off immediately, so instead, researchers propose heating the high silicate lunar soil with either a kiln or the focused power of the sun itself to melt some of the particles allowing them to reform in this crystalline formation, and voila, we have dry concrete. The only problem with this method is that it would take a lot of energy. Regolith melts at about 1000 degrees Celsius and requires large equipment to pull off. The last two options are similar, and they involve essentially creating sandbags with regolith, either with a binding agent we'd have to bring with us or on its own. Sandbags are a very simple and effective way to make concrete-like structures that can stand for a very long period of time. This method is the easiest, as you would imagine, as it can be done cold and can be put up quickly, but because it's not really concrete, it doesn't have the compressive strength that we are really looking for. But the research paper doesn't just classify the best methods with sandbagging and melting being the clear winners, it also suggests which method we should be using for which application. For instance, in terms of pure efficiency, the sandbag methods make the most sense for at least the fast expansion of large installations that might not require stable concrete. Obviously, the melting technique creates a very strong material that can be used anytime we would need a strong foundation for things like roadways, landing pads, and heavy equipment. 
This research confirms a line of thinking that many in the space industry have been wondering about for a few years now, and it seems likely that any future colony started by any country will have a lot of lunar concrete making up the strongest parts of its structures.